Thank you for uh, the introduction. So I would like to tell you about uh, one of the two things we do in the lab, which is looking at uh, RNA biogenesis in uh, microscopy, using microscopy approaches. So as you all know, so gene expression requires a, a series of uh, successive steps. So when you have a gene like this, so you, have, you need to have polymerases that come on the promoter and initiate transcription. Then you need to transcribe all the genes, process the RNA. Then after the RNA is processed at the free primary, you need to splice it, to export it, and then finally you can get to translate it in the cytoplasm. So all these processes have been studied for many, many years and they are very well known on the biochemical and structural levels. We have structure of RNA polymerases, ribosome, you know, export factor and everything. So what uh, we are trying to do is to look at these steps using a single cells and microscopy approaches. So why I will first try to explain you why we want to do this. Because despite you know, all this biochemical work, we still don't understand well how these machineries are working in the cells. So for instance, if we take a transcription, so the, the in vivo kinetics of the transcription are not well characterized in vivo, so the elongation rate of the RNA polymerase is not known in detail, you know, how much it poses and things like this also is not, uh, not really known. But what we know is that these are important parameters for the regulation of gene expression. And the second thing is that when you start to look at things in single cells, you can have surprises. And for instance, one of the discoveries that has been made in the last few years is that transcription initiation is not a continuous process. It's a discontinuous one where the gene goes with phase on its own and phase on its off. So you have pulsing of gene activity. So this is illustrated here in fixed cells where you have a, a, a cell line that is, has been engineered to express a, a reporter gene, and you can see that you have a bright spot in the nucleoplasm in some cells, which means that the gene is on and is being transcribed, and in other cells, it's off. And we can do the same experiment in live cells with the, <coughs> uh, the MS2 tagging system that I will explain in a minute. And you can see that this is a 40-minute movie, so with one stack every minute, you can see that the gene comes on and off over time constantly, so it's pulsing. Uh, and this is the quantification of, of the data. So this was surprising because most people imagine that you would just have you know, polymerase coming on transcribed engine and, and that would be like this. So why do you have uh, such variation in the initiation rate over time? So the problem is that uh, all the gene expression process they have to deal with very small number of molecules. So you have, you have one gene template, a few polymerases that are going to transcribe. So the problem is that when you have uh, so few molecules that you have a lot of variation in number over time. So if you, as an example, if you take the two molecules, the blue one and the green one, so we know that the two molecules can interact with each other. So if you have only one of the blue molecules, so either you have one interacting partner, so you do transcribe if you want, then it comes off, then it binds again, then maybe you have two, then it comes off again, etc. So you have, because of the small number of molecules, you have a lot of variation over time. So in contrast, if you have many molecules, so you have uh, some protein will uh, dissociate or that will bind. So on the average, we'll have more or less the same number that of uh, binding events. So this is one of the reasons why you have uh, this variation initiation. Okay, and we know that this is important because this has given the notion of transcriptional noise. So what this means is that if you take these are yeast cells now, well, we have a, a reporter that is stably integrated and expressed under a TED promoter. So if you look at different cells, so you can see that, uh, so you can see by in situ hybridization the individual molecule of mRNA. So you can see that some cells have a lot of mRNA and other cells have little or no mRNA at all. So you don't get the same expression level in the cell, uh, uh, from different cells in the cell population. And this is a quantification. You can see that we put the reporter either in a TED on or a TET off, you can see that you can have cells that have 80 copies of RNA, while others don't express it at all. So this is important because of, obviously, you know, the protein content of this cell will be different as well, and that can affect the cell physiology. And I want to point out this paper that was published a few years ago that has been shown for HSP70 genes in yeast, that these genes are very noisy, so you get a lot of variation in the expression from a cell-to-cell -cell basis. And what they showed in this paper, that this is very important for the function of the gene. So having a noisy gene can give you a better response to stress and a better survival 
in the population. Okay, so this is true for transcription initiation, but you have the same problem at all steps along the gene expression pathway because uh, you have one gene, but you also have a few molecules of transcribing polymerases. You have few molecules of nascent RNA that you need trans to transcribe. So that at all points along the expression pathway, you have to do with small, longer, small number of molecules, so with stochasticity due, to, due to, to this. So the question we want to ask is, how do the cell deal with this problem? Uh, are all the steps you know, in gene expression really noisy or, or in contrast, you have a way to make the step more deterministic and better controlled. So I'll not talk, so our aims in the lab are to characterize the kinetics you know, of uh, transcription on RNA processing in live cells during, using microscopy approaches. And uh, we want to do this, of course, at the level of single cells, single genes, and whenever we can, we want to do it at the level of single molecules as well. Of course, I, I will not talk about the transcription, but I want to um, develop you know, similar ideas in the field of splicing kinetics. Okay, so first of all, I want to remind you how, what the method we use to visualize RNA in live cells. So it's a two-component system. So on one side, you have a GFP molecule fused, fused to the code protein of bacteriophage MS2. And then we have a reporter gene. And what we do is, in this, the free permutation of this reporter gene, we insert binding site for the MS2 protein. So when we co-express the two in the cells, uh, the GFP MS2 binds to the RNA, and we can see it in live cells. And what we showed earlier on is that if you use uh, six binding sites for the MS2, so you can uh, see the RNA in live cells. So this is shown here in the cytoplasm. So we have inserted also nuclear localization signal in the protein. So if a cell doesn't express the RNA, the protein is nuclear. And if the cell co-express the RNA, then the, the RNA drags the protein in the cytoplasm, and then you can see the RNA there. So with six sites, we have a diffuse signal. But if we increase the number of MS2 sites to 24, then we can distinguish individual dots. And we showed by uh, several methods that these dots correspond to individual mRNA molecules. So uh, you can follow them in fixed cells. And this is just to show you another movie where this is a cell that has been transfected with the reporter. So you can see the, in the nucleus the signal. And in the cytoplasm, you can see all these little dots that are moving over time and that correspond to single mRNA molecules. And you can you know, do a lot of things, you know, follow them, study the movement, and etc., etc. Okay, but what I want to discuss is about splicing. So just to remind you, the splicing reaction is a two-step chemical reaction. So in the first uh, chemical step, you have the, the branch point of the intron that is attacking the five prime splice sites to give uh, the free exon one on the lariat. And then you have the first exon that is attacking the the spice acceptor junction to get the spiced RNA on one side and the intron on the other side. Okay, this reaction is carried out by the spliceosome. So the spliceosome has to be assembled on every mRNA at each uh, splicing round. So uh, it's composed of five SNRNP that uh, are, are at the heart of the spliceosome on a number of proteins, so about 100 proteins. So you first start assembly by having U1 recognizing the, the spice donor, and then having U2 AF recognizing the um, spice acceptor sites. Then you load U2 on the pre-mRNA in an ATP-dependent manner. Then you recruit the U4, U5, U6 complex to make uh, what is called the B complex that is getting activated by using U1 on U4. Then you carry the first chemical step of the reaction. You remodel the spices and you carry the second step of the reaction. So this is a very complicated reaction that involves a large number of, of uh, molecules. And one of the major questions in the field is, you know, how do you make the spliceosome at every cycle? And also, how do you recognize the splice site is still unclear. OK, so the reporter we used is based of, uh, on the MINX intron. So this is a, an artificial intron that has been derived from adenovirus. It is known to splice very efficiently in vitro, so it is why we used this system uh, in vivo. So we made two reporter constructs. In one reporter, we inserted four MS2 sites in exon two. And in the second construct, we inserted four MS2 sites within the intron, such as to, to visualize the intron, the spicing reaction in living cells. So then what we did is to integrate this reporter in U2OS cells, and then we selected cells that had 
uh, many copies integrated in tandem, such as to obtain a very bright transcription site where we can have a, a good signal on to do microscopy uh, techniques. And this is one of the cell lines that uh, we derived. So you can see by in situ hybridization with LAXI, which is in exon 2, that we get the transcription site, we get the RNA produced. And to just to show you that the transcription is very high, so if you do a staining for RNA polymerase 2, you can see that the polymerase accumulates at the transcription site because you have so many active genes at this spot. Uh, you even see an accumulation of the polymerase on, of most of the RNA processing factor as well. So the first thing was to verify that the splicing of this intron occurs at the transcription site. So we did two assays to show that uh, splicing is indeed co-transcriptional. So in the first uh, <coughs> assay, we did in situ hybridization with probes that bound either in the intron. We used also an oligo probe that recognizes only the spliced message on the third intron that recognizes in exon 2, that is all the RNA produced from these reported genes. So if you look in... Uh, normal cells, so you can detect the intron at the transcription site, exon 2, and you also detect the spliced message at the transcription site. And to show that this is really specific, so we treated the cells with the spliceostatin. So this is a small molecule inhibitor that was developed by a Japanese group, and that inhibits splicing very efficiently. So you can see that in this case, we do have a signal for the intronic probe, the exon 2, but we lose the signal for the spliced message at the transcription site. We still keep the signal in the cytoplasm because we treat the cell for a short time, so we still see RNA that were made before the addition of the drug. Okay, so then to have, a, uh, so this shows you that there is co-transcriptional splicing, so to quantify the amount of splicing, we did an RT-PCR assay, and what we simply did is to use a primer for the reverse transcriptase that binds after the cleavage site at the free prime end of the pre-mRNA. So this way we, we detect only nascent pre-mRNA that has, are still attached to the DNA template. And then we did the PCR across the intron to see uh, the, the, if the RNA was spliced or not. So in normal cells, we detect only the spliced message. When you treat with spliceostatin, we detect only the unspliced message. So this shows you that splicing of this intron is quantitatively spliced before the RNA is released from the DNA template. Okay, so then we looked at the recruitment of the spacing factors to the transcription site. So we looked at all the SNRNPs by a two-color hybridization. So in fact, what you can see that you do see a little bit of uh, every SNRNA at the transcription site of the mix intron, but you don't see much of an accumulation. And we were a bit puzzled by this observation, but then what we did is repeat the same experiment when we treat the cell with spisostatin. So spisostatin, it binds to a component of U2, SNRNP, but it doesn't block the recruitment of U2, so it just blocks activation of the spisosome. And what you can see here is that when you inhibit uh, spicing with spisostatin, you get a very strong recruitment of all the SNRNP at the transcription site. So in fact, if you look only at the SNRNA localization, you can spot the transcription site because this is the brightest spot of accumulation uh, of the SNRNA. So what this tells you is that in the normal case, you don't get much of an accumulation because the spacing reaction is efficient, it goes quickly, and each SNRNA remains a short time on the pre-mRNA, which is not the case here because you don't get splicing, so the SNOP stays on the mRNA until it leaves the transcription site. Okay, so then what we did to analyze the kinetics, we, so we simply... Uh, uh, transfected the MS to GFP into the cell line and, and used FRAP experiment at the transcription site to measure the recovery of the uh, MS to GFP, which corresponds to the turnover of the intron. So what we measure by this assay is the residency time of the intron at the transcription site. So what we get is the, is the blue curve. And then we compare it to the cell line where the MS2 site is in exon 2. So this corresponds to the re residency time of the pre-mRNA. So you can see that the intron remains a shorter time at the transcription site, and this is also confirming that it's because uh, it's likely that this co-transcription is spliced, so it gets removed and degraded before uh, the RNA leaves the transcription site. So then the problem is that, uh, okay, this is nice. You can see that spicing occurs in something like three to four minutes. So what kind of other information can you get from this curve? So as I said before, so the spicing reaction is a very complicated process with hundreds of molecules. 
So it's basically impossible to build a model you know, that accounts for all these individual reactions and try to fit this kind of model with the FRAP curve we obtain. So then we decided to ask a very simple question. So the question we ask is whether there is a single rate limiting step in the reaction or whether there are multiple, multiple rate limiting steps in the reaction. And uh, so I will explain in a minute why this, we think this is important. So uh, in that case, what you get is that this single step gives the rate of the reaction. So you should get a simple ex exponential decay in your FAB curve. In this case, you have several steps of equal rates. So then you get slightly more complicated curve. But still, uh, this you can solve by a mathematical analysis. So you can find a mathematical equation that describes uh, the recovery of the intron for two steps, three steps, and etc. And so this uh, solution were found by uh, Stuart Aitken that is at the University of Edinburgh. He's uh, collaborated with us on this problem. And what he did also is to fit the, the FRAP curve on the intron with all of these models. So if you have a single step model, so you should get an exponential, so that is the red curve. So then what you can do is to optimize the parameter to find the best possible fit. Then you repeat the same thing for a two-step model and for a three-step model and etc. And so the results are, the, the results of the fits are represented here. So what you have, this is the number of steps that you have in the model. And the better the fit, you know, the lower is this value. So you can see that you have an improvement in the model when you go from one step to two steps to three steps. Then from three steps to six steps, it's about the same goodness of the fit. And then it goes worse again, so you lose the, the fit. So that tells you that. Uh, you know, you have between three to six, or let's say two, two to six limiting steps in your model. That's the prediction of the, the, the fit. Okay, so why is this important? So the importance becomes more apparent if you look at the, the rate of appearance of the, of the spliced product in your reaction. So if you have a one-step model, so what you expect for the appearance of the Spliced RNA is also a simple exponential. But if you have a three-step model, then uh, you get more sigmoidal, sigmoidal curve. And the more steps you add, the more sharp you know, is the, the sigmoid. So that tells you that if you have a single-step model, so you have some molecules splice very quickly, while other molecules splice very late. So you have a wide range if you look at the splicing, the time it takes to splice every different molecule. So some do splice very quickly some splice very late, so you have a, a wide distribution in the splicing rate. So in contrast, if you have a three-step model, then you can see that all the molecules tend to splice at about the same rate. That means that every molecule will take the same time to complete the splicing reaction. Okay, and the, the reason why we think this is important is because the, of the regulation of alternative splicing. So there are many ways to regulate alternative splicing, but one of the ways that has become important in the recent years, thanks to work by Alberto Conblit and uh, colleagues, is what they call the kinetic regulation of alternative splicing. So in that case, what, what you have is a, um, let's consider this case where you have uh, two acceptor sites that are competing for a single splice donor site. So what uh, has been observed is that if you have a weak acceptor site that is uh, first transcribed on a strong acceptor site that is transcribed later. So um, if the polymerase goes slowly, so what happens is that for a long time you, you will have spicing only uh, with this spice junction because this one simply doesn't exist. Okay, so in contrast, now if you accelerate the rate of polymerase elongation, so what happens is that now you have uh, as soon as you transcribe this one, very quickly after you will transcribe this strong one, so then the two splice sites will become in competition, so then you will five on splice at the strong site, which is this one. So this way you can regulate alternative splicing by the rate of elongation, and Alberto Combit recently showed in a paper in Cell that in fact this is used uh, during stress. When you stress the cell, you slow down the polymerase, and that gives you global rates in change of alternative splicing. Okay, so now if we look at the kinetic view of the spacing reaction, and we look at the two different models. 
So if we take the single step model, so let's say we are the time to, to transcribe the sequence between the two acceptor spike sites is here. So it means that uh, uh, when the polymerase goes at this rate, we have 90% of spacing at the first site. Now, if we divide, if we accelerate the polymerase by the factor of two, so now uh, we will be at this point in the curve. So it means that we will splice uh, at the first site only in 70% of the case. So it means that you will do indeed change alternative spacing, but you only go from 90% to 70%. Right? So you have a poor regulation of spacing. Now, if we take the second case where, where we have a three-step model, where the, the, the kinetic of the spacing reaction is more deterministic, right? all molecules space at about the same time. So with the same parameter, so with um, a polymerase that goes at this rate, we get 80% of passing at the first site. But now if we divide the rate of elongation by the factor of two, what happens is that we are at this point in the curve and we get only one third of passing at the first site. It means that with the same parameter of same change in elongation, you get a much larger change in two alternative spacing. And this is because the spacing reaction becomes more deterministic and all the molecules do splice at the same time. Okay, so the conclusion for this part is that you know, when you have, multi in, if you take any process, so if you have a single limiting step, or if, you are, if you have many successive steps that limit the reaction, so to have multiple steps allows you to control the kinetic of the reaction. So you have less noise in the kinetics and all molecules will behave the same way in, uh, in your reaction. And we think that this is important because this allows you a tight kinetic control of the process. So in that case, this is splicing. And we also would like to propose that this is important for gene expression because in many cases, we deal with very small number of molecules. So where, where to have a kinetic control of the process is important because it allows you to reduce uh, the noise. OK, so now we'll tell you a second story that has to do with quality control of uh, mRNA production. So this is just to uh, illustrate that all steps, in, or most of the steps in the mRNA production pathway are interconnected. And all these interconnections are used you know, as a checkpoint to make sure that you know, the step you know, transcription is properly done. So then you go on and you continue for the next step, and et cetera, and et cetera. OK, so the story starts with the same reporter and also with spisostatin. So what we observe is that when we put spisostatin on our reporter, so the transcription site of the reporter RNA becomes brighter. Right, so it goes from here to there. So we quantify this and we show that this, in average, is a two-fold increase of the RNA at the transcription site. And this is dependent on the splicing because if you take exactly the same reporter, we remove the intron and we treat with spisostatin, we don't have any effect. So we have an increase in transcription at, in the size of the transcription site that is dependent on the spicing reaction. OK, and we, this, we did the FRAP experiment to, to analyze the kinetic you know, of the RNA when you have a spisostatin uh, treated cells. And we, we could show that in that case, the RNA is very poorly dynamic, so it stays at the transcription site for a very long time. So it means that the RNA is retained at the transcription site, and this is why you accumulate and accumulate the RNA at the transcription site once you inhibit the splicing reaction. Okay, so then the question, what are exactly these retained RNA? So there are two possibilities. So one possibility is that they are still attached, you know, to pole, transforming pole to attach to the gene. The second possibility is that they are detached from the gene and retained by some unknown mechanism near the transcription site. So to address this question, what we did is to make uh, several probes against different uh, parts of the um, RNAs. So one probe is against like Z, one probe is just before the end of the RNA at the cleavage site, and one probe is after the cleavage site, so it detects only the nascent RNA that are attached to POL2. OK, and then we look in uh, cells before and after spisostatin treatment. So with the probe that detects the intron, we see a nice increase you know, in the size of the transcription due to re the retention of the, the RNA. If you look at the probe that is just before the end of the, the RNA, we also see that you know, the signal for this probe increase, which means that the RNA that is retained is full length or nearly full length. 
And in contrast, if we look at the probe that is after the cleavage site, so this probe doesn't show an increase you know, in signal after uh, treatment with spicostatin. And moreover, what we see is that in non-treated cells, we have the signal of the exon exonic probe on the post poly probe that co-localized perfectly. And after treatment with spicostatin, we see that the signal for the RNA extends uh, around the, the signal for the nascent RNA also uh, suggesting that you know, the RNA that is retained has been cleaved, but is retained next to the transcription site. Okay, then we wanted to look at uh, POL2 to see we, we, whether we will see also an accumulation of POL2. So in fact, we, we don't see an accumulation of POL2, and in contrast, if you look at the very large transcription sites after specialty treatment, what we can see is that POL2 is excluded from the large RNA signal. So that also confirms that the RNA has been detached from the polymerase. We also looked at the poly A status of the RNA. Okay, so that's the same experiment using an oligodity probe to look at the polyadenated RNA. And very much like for POL2, we can see that we have an exclusion, an exclusion of polyadenated RNA at the transcription site. So altogether, T suggests that the RNA that is retained, you know, is fully transcribed but has been cleaved, but lacks a polyethyl. So to confirm this experiment, so we did a couple of biochemical um, analysis. So the first one was to look at the, the ends of the RNA. So we did an RNA protection assay with a probe that overlaps the cleavage site at the free prime end. So what you can see in normal cells, so this is the uncleaved pre-mRNA. This is the cleaved message. When you treat with spasostatin, you don't get any change in the uncleaved RNA. But what you see, you see an increase in signal for the cleaved RNA, and you also, also detect these shorter products that have been apparently trimmed you know, from the free prime end. So that tells you that indeed, so the spisostatin treatment doesn't affect the cleavage, so the RNA indeed is cleaved and made properly, and the retained species is probably uh, slightly shorter than the, the mature species. So to prove this completely, so what we did is to, uh, to clone and sequence the ends of the uh, retained RNA. So what we did is to extract RNA from wild-type untreated and treated cells, circularize the RNA, and amplify it across the 5 prime, 3 prime junction using either a primer that uh, are in the intron to detect the unspliced RNA, or a primer that is across the spliced junction to detect the spliced RNA. So then we clone and sequence the RNA. And the results are shown here. So these are the PCR uh, products. So in the case of the wild-type RNA that is uh, spliced, either in spisostatin treated cells or in non-treated cells, so what we see is that the RNA is initiated transcription at the correct site, and all the RNA are polyadenated at the correct site as well. So if we look at the spliced RNA in spisostatin treated cells, we see the same. And this is because this RNA was made before the addition of the, the drug, so they have, the drug has no effect on RNA that are already processed on mature. So now if we looked at the unspliced RNA in spisostatin treated cells, what we detect is about one-third of the RNA are perfectly normal, so they have the normal transcription site and they have a polyethyl, but about two-thirds of the RNA, they lack a polyethyl, and furthermore, they end uh, at few nucleotides before the, the cleavage site, meaning that they have been twinned from the free prime end uh, into the body of uh, the RNA. Okay, so the, the model we have to explain this data is that when you have co-transcriptional splicing, so if you have a block in the splicing reaction, so you have the spliceosome on the pre mRNA but it cannot splice for some reason, then what happens is that you have a quality control step, so you do cleave and most likely polyadenate the RNA, but after this, uh, you deadenate the RNA and trim it at the free prime end, and then you accumulate the RNA at the transcription site without the polyethyl. And in fact, there are data in this and in other systems that show that if you produce an RNA that lacks a polyethyl, it's not exported, and also it, it can remain at the transcription site as well. So this could be the mechanisms of the retention, but could also be uh, slightly different. And this is, I just want like to point out that you know, there are also similar mechanisms that operate in yeast, but in yeast what has been shown is that RNA that, that assemble the spicosome but cannot be spliced, they are retained at the cell periphery next to the nuclear pore by a, a complex 
called the MLP protein. So it seems that in that case, you have different quality control procedures for yeast and for mammalian cells. Okay, then I would like to show you another very unexpected result that uh, we observed. So um, we did the same experiment um, of characterizing the ends of the RNA for the wild type cell. So in the PCR product, when you looked at unspliced RNA, you know, we cannot detect any unspliced RNA because most likely splicing occurs before the end of the RNA. But, you know, we still try to clone, you know, and characterize this, and we did obtain several clones and sequence them. And the surprise that uh, we had is that the RNA that uh, are unspliced in the normal situation in wild type cells, they are also are like a poly polyethyl. They are also trimmed at the free prime end, so it shows that they went to these quality control procedures. But the big surprise was that we all this RNA that start at the wrong initiation site, which is four nucleotide upstream of the normal site. So this shows that in the normal situation, so you have polymerase initiating normally that go to cotton signal splicing. You also have polymerase that somehow initiate at the wrong sites that is displaced from a few nucleotides. And this polymerase, they are somehow defective for co-transcriptional splicing. And what happens is that the RNA is subjected to this quality control mechanism and is most likely deadenylated and retained at the site of transcription. And the other interesting thing that this data shows is that this defective polymerase, they should assemble the spiceosome because the retention is dependent on spiceosome assembly. So this shows you that the defective polymerase what they do is that it seems that they prevent activation of the spiceosome or they are unable to activate the spiceosome while it's transcribing. So this shows that there is a role, likely role of the polymerase in activating spiceosome when you have co-transcriptional spicing reactions. Okay, so in the last part of my talk, I would like to discuss a little bit uh, the dynamic of spicing factors. And I want to talk about uh, the U1 SNRNA. SNRNP. So U1 SNRNP is very important because it's, it is the molecule that recognizes the splice donor sequences. And uh, so one of the main questions in the field of splicing is that it's very unclear how do you define the splice set. So we have consensus sequences for U1, for U2, you have an answer of splicing, etc. But if you just look at the sequence like this and you try to predict you know, where the splicing will occur um, just knowing this consensus sequence, it's very hard to predict the splice sites. So that means that we lack some understanding on how exactly, you know, what defines an exon and what defines an intron. So what we thought is that maybe to um, understand this process, we need to understand how U1 and how this early molecule recognize their uh, recognition sites on the pre-mRNA. Okay, so what we did is to look at the dynamic of U1 on two different pre-mRNA. So one is the minx pre mRNA that has just showed you that do splice co-transcriptionally. And the second one that we use, is, it's an HIV-1-based vector, which is the same one that is used by Alessandro to look at uh, transcription elongation and that does not splice co-transcriptionally. It does recruit U1, but none of the other factors. And this is shown here. So this is the reporter, the HIV-1 reporter. So you have the major splice donor, you have the last acceptor site. So if you look with specific probes for pre-mRNA or spice message, what we can see is that at the transcription site, uh, we do detect the pre-mRNA. We also detect the pre-mRNA in the nucleoplasm outside the transcription site. And if we look for the spliced message, we detect very, very little of it at the transcription site. So we could quantify this, and we show that less than 10% of the RNA is spliced at the transcription site. So the splicing in this case occurs in the nucleoplasm after the RNA has been released uh, from the DNA template. Okay, so in the case of HIV-1, so we could show that U1 is recruited at the transcription site. So this is an in-situ hybridization for U1. This is the transcription site of this HIV. You can see that you do accumulate U1. Okay, but you accumulate none of the other SNRP. So there is no U2, there is no U2 AF, no U4, U5, U6. So the only spacing factor you get is U1. So that allows you to look at the binding of U1 to the spice donor sequence in absence of any spiceosomal assembly. Okay, so 
to look at this U1, so it has three specific proteins, so U1A, U170K, and U1C. So what we use is a fusion between uh, GFP and U170K. And so we perform FRAP experiments uh, using U1GFP at the transcription sites of the HIV-1 RNA to look at the dynamic of the U1S and RNP. So what we could see is that in the case of the HIV-1 reporter, so we get a fast recovery of the protein. So the time scale is in seconds now here. So it means that in about six to seven seconds, the, you, you recover the signal. So the protein has a high turnover. And most likely, the SNRNP has a high turnover on the pre-mRNA. So now if you look at the minx reporter where you do get spisosome assembly, so we get a slower recovery meaning that, uh, you know, most likely the SNRNP stays longer because it interacts with the other component of the spisosome and that stabilizes the, the, the SNRNP on the pre-mRNA. And we think that this is important because the problem in, uh, in uh, spicing, so yeah, you need to have U1 recognizing the spice donor sequences so the problem is that the spice donor consensus is very short. So if you look at pre-mRNA sequences, you will find many sites where you want can bind the pre-mRNA. So and we think that this is why the SNRNP comes on and off the pre-mRNA fairly quickly because it binds a consensus sequence for the spice donor. If there is no spiceosomal signal around, it just dissociates and goes to another site. If the binding was stable, then you will have U1 bound and uh, you will start spisosome assembly because it will stay, remain bound to the spider donor sequence. So to have this rapid kinetics of binding on uh, dissociation of the SNRNP, it allows you to have U1 to sample all the sequences available on the pre-mRNA to find the correct splice donor sequences. Okay, so then we did similar experiment with the uh, other U1 specific proteins. So we did the U1A GFP and U1C GFP. And the surprise, so all this protein gets recruited to the transcription sites you know, of the uh, minx pre-mRNA because you do get the full, it tells you that you do get the full SNRNP you know, recruited uh, on the pre-mRNA. So for instance, if you look for U1C, so you can see that, that the transcription sites, and you can see an enrichment of U1C at the transcription site. And if you treat it with spisostatin, so you have a stronger accumulation of UNC because I showed you just the SNRNA remains stuck on the pre-mRNA. Okay, so if you compare the dynamic, you know, the binding of this U1 specific protein on the uh, minx pre-mRNA, so this is the curve for U170K, the surprise that if you look at the other two U1 specific protein, they recover at very different rates. And in fact, so U1, U1C comes on and off the the pre-mRNA very, very quickly. So what that tells you, so it tells you that you have these specific proteins bound to the SNRNP that they constantly come on and off the U1 uh, RNA. So U1C comes on and off very, very quickly. U1A slightly less quickly, and U170K probably very slowly. Okay, so we think this is interesting because U1, I mean, this is the archetypa, archetypical uh, RNP particle that has been studied for many times. People have purified it. You, you have, people have done cryo-EM, structural studies. There is even a crystal structure of the SNRNP. But the way this you know, entity exists in the cell is very dynamic. So you have the protein constantly coming on and off the U1 particle. And uh, what we'd like to think is that maybe this dynamic of the U1 specific protein on U1, they are important for the function of U1 in splicing. And what is especially intriguing is that U1C, so this is the one that comes on and off very quickly from U1 SNRNA. And in the crystal structure of U1, what they show is that U1C it is precisely the protein that binds to the splice donor U1 duplex SNRNA. And there are also a lot of biochemical data that have shown that you require U1C you know, to stabilize the binding of U1 to the pre-mRNA. So we believe that there is something in the, the fact that the protein comes on and off very quickly that is important you know, to um, stabilize the binding of the U1 on the pre-mRNA spicing site. Okay, so I will stop here. I would like to acknowledge the people uh, 
that did the work in the lab. So it was done mostly by uh, uh, three postdocs in the lab on one technician. And we also benefited from collaboration from uh, Stuart Aitken from the modeling part of the reaction from the University of in Edinburgh. We also uh, had uh, help from Paolo and Marcello to do the, I didn't show it, but to fit the dissociation curve to get, you know, an on off rate for the U1 on the pmRNA. And also we collaborated with Al Alberto Conblitz on this co-transcriptional uh, thing, and also from the Japanese group for the gift of uh, spisostatin. <coughs> so thank you. Thank you.